Hello and welcome to the God's Words Bible Study and as usual we'll start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God we thank you Lord for all that you do and we pray Lord that as we open your book you'll open our hearts and our understanding and that you will give us the courage and the strength to do what we have learned. In the holy name of Jesus Christ your Son our Savior we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. And we are on the book of 1 John, where we are doing an expositional Bible study, meaning that we are going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. And the last time we met, we stopped at 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. And as I promised, that's exactly where we will start. So let's read 1 John chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Amen, amen. And before we start our study proper, I'd like to reread today's passage, adding verse 6. And as I read it, I want you to ask yourself one question. Do you fall short of what John is describing here? If you applied what John is saying here to yourself, not to anybody else, just to yourself. Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Are you a Christian? By what John is saying here. So let's go, starting at verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remained in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now are you a Christian? Let's go line by line, word by word, and find out for yourself and for me if we are Christians. And so let's go to verse 7 which says, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. What that is saying is that there will always be people in your life who will pacify you, who when you doubt that you are living the life that you know you're supposed to live, they will tell you that, hey, it's okay. Everybody does it. But remember, Jesus warned us that the road is narrow and there are few that find it. So if everybody is doing it, beware. Then in verse 8 he says, He that committed sin is of the devil. Now hold on, John, what are you saying here? You're saying that it doesn't matter what I profess with my mouth and how I behave around people? Because this seems to be a very dogmatic statement. He that committed sin is of the devil. Okay, to get a little insight into what John is speaking about here, let's go to Job chapter 1 and listen in on a conversation that God is having with Satan. And that's Job chapter 1 verses 8 through 11. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge around him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. 
So what Satan is telling God here is that your best disciple, your best church member, your best Christian is a fraud. And the only reason why they are serving you is because of what you're giving them. So you're paying them. They're hired help for you, but they belong to me. Because the moment you cut off the supply, they run right back home to daddy. That's what Satan is saying here. Satan is saying, you have no true followers, God. You have no children on the earth. They all belong to me. And the only time they seem to favor you is when you give them stuff. And this is the accusation that Satan makes against every single one of God's followers. You know why? Because it's true. For most of us, it's true. And that is why John say, he that committed sin is of the devil. What does committing sin represent? You running home to daddy, the devil. And cursing God to his face. Exactly. And that's what you do when you claim to be a Christian and continue in sin. As my wife said, you're cursing God to his face. And I know this as a fact because I remember when the tsunami happened in Asia. You remember that? Killed about a quarter million people. I remember that Saturday I went to church and people were losing their minds. People were questioning the very existence of God. And I was appalled. And I said, is this what we do when a calamity hits halfway around the world where we know nobody? What happens when it hits closer to home? What happens when it touches our father and our mother and our brothers and our sisters and, God forbid, our children? We would abandon God lickety split because we are, for the most part, nominal Christians. We follow God because right now it benefits us in some way. We have to get past this. We are Christians not because of us. We are Christians because God is true. And to see what Jesus has to say about this, that he that committed sin is of the devil, let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 to 25. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Amen. So what Jesus is saying here is that, listen, if you're going to serve God, serve Him. And if you're worrying about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and what you're going to put on and if you're worrying about all the things that has to do with this world, you're not really serving God. Because God has promised that he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And if you trust that, as you should trust your heavenly father that he will provide what is necessary for your well-being, then you won't be worrying about these things. You see, trust does not include worry. And so Jesus is saying that, hey, listen, make up your mind. Either you're going to trust this world and worry about these things, or you're going to trust God and go about his business. But John continues in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He says, he that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. And again, we have to figure out what beginning. Because this beginning is not the beginning in Genesis. When John says here, the devil sinned from the beginning, he sinned from the beginning of sin, before the world was created. So I guess you could paraphrase it and say he's the originator of sin. Exactly. And so let's go to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14 to see where we're getting this. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
and that is where sin came from. Sin came from Satan. Coveting God's position. Exactly. Looking at God and saying, I would be a better God. But John continues in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the work of the devil. So why did Jesus come? Jesus came to destroy everything that Satan had built. And so we can see this in Hebrews chapter 2, 14 to 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Amen, amen. And folks, this is one of the scariest things that you can see in real life. When someone is on their deathbed, and you can see the fear and the terror in their eyes because they don't know where they're going to go when they die. Or, in fact, maybe they do know where they're going when they die. And Paul is saying here that, listen, Jesus came to take that fear away, to give us the assurance of salvation so that we can live free. Because as long as we fear death, it means that we're living in sin. So simple as that. Once you are in the kingdom of God, once you are living a life of righteousness, you no longer fear death because death is a promotion. And John continues in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. He says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So what he's saying here is that the reason why the sons of God, the born-again Christian, cannot sin is because God's seed remains in him. And so, let's find out what this verse is saying. And the first part of the verse says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Do not commit sin. And for that, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 to 18. Know ye not that your body are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What, know ye not that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And the price that you are bought with is? Jesus' life. The, the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus' life is suffering his death. That is the price that was paid for you. And so when you who are the temple of God, you are the temple of God, why? Because as John says, his seed abideth, his seed liveth in you, God lives in you. And so when you go to sin, no matter what the sin is, you are actually dragging God into your mess. And if you remember that you were bought with a price and what that price is, then that should stop you. That alone should stop you. If you are conscious, and this is why, folks, we are not Christians on Saturdays or Sundays. We are Christians all the time, every day, every minute. And so we have to be really conscious of who we are and whose we are, and that we are always in the very throne room of God. If we are conscious of that, I guarantee you, sin will depart from your life. And Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45 tells us why a Christian cannot commit sin, but someone who is a church member or a Christian in name only will always commit sin. And so let's go. Matthew chapter 12, 43 to 45. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return unto my house from whence I came out. 
and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Amen, amen. And what Matthew is describing here, what Jesus is describing here, is what happened when someone accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He comes in and he does what? He cleans that house. He cleans that person. But if the person does not invite the Holy Spirit, does not ensure that the Holy Spirit comes and abide in him, live in him, then what happened is that is always, that's the, the evil man. spirit, the old man. He comes back. And when he comes back, he sees things so much better than he left them. And he gets excited and he goes out and he invites seven more spirits, more wicked and evil than himself. And they come in and they live now with that man. That's what it said, isn't it? He said, they enter in and dwell there. They enter in and they abide there. You see, what's supposed to be abiding in this man? It's supposed to be the Holy Spirit. It's supposed to be the seed of God. But instead, what it is, is a whole bunch of demons. But this man will go to church every single week and think that he's a Christian. But he is wickeder now. He is worse now than before he met Christ. But he thinks he's a Christian and he thinks that this is the Christian life. That he just sin up a storm and pray a prayer and God forgives him. But remember, John said that, what? Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin for his seed. And when I say his seed, that is God's seed remained in him. And we know that this seed that God plants in this man is the Holy Spirit. That's the seed that's living in you. That's the seed that's empowering you. And we must remember when it says his seed remained in him, it is what we discussed earlier, which is it remain, it abide, it continues. You're always a Christian. You're always on the job. You're always on duty. And listen, folks, one of the things that we get wrong in church is that we say we die daily. Folks, <laughs> let me tell you something. If you die to your sin once, you're not going to want to repeat it. You're going to die to your sin once and you're going to remain dead to your sin. You don't have to die daily. All you have to do is ask God once to come in and to live in your life. And he will live with you daily. But you don't have to die daily. You only need to do it once. You only need to profess Jesus Christ once. You only need to be baptized once. You only need to become a child of God once. And then you remain a child of God. You remain baptized. You remain a Christian for the rest of your life. But you're going to say, but Paul says, I die daily. Well, folks, let me explain something. When Paul said that, Paul was not talking about what you're talking about. Here's what Paul was talking about. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 19. And this is going to be a long reading, but I just want you to understand what Paul meant when he say, I die daily. He starts at verse 12 and he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, he says, Now... If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? You see, that's just logics, right? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So Paul is saying here that, listen folks, if the dead doesn't rise, Jesus didn't rise. And if Jesus didn't rise, we're worse than we were before we started telling people that God raised him from the dead. We're liars. We're liars. But we're not just liars, but we're drawing away people from serving the true and living deceivers. God. We're deceivers. Verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet, you are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. 
If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And what he's saying here is that, listen folks, as a Christian, as a follower of God, as a child of the King, I will give up multitudes of pleasure in this life to serve my God. And if there is no God that I'm serving, if I'm serving a lie, then I am more miserable than everybody else who is enjoying those things for themselves. You see, that's basically what he's saying. But let's skip down in the same chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to verse 30. And he asks the question, And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Now catch this what he's talking about. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So let me break it down and you can go back and read the entire chapter for yourself. What Paul is saying here is that, listen guys, if the dead doesn't rise, then Christ didn't rise. And if Christ didn't rise, then all of this Christianity thing is foolishness and I'm in trouble. But he goes on and he says, no, 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 I'm sure of this. That's why he puts his life at risk every day. And that's why he's risking his life every day to tell people about Jesus Christ. And he says, why am I dying daily? What Paul is saying is that, Every day I get up and I leave my house to go preach the gospel. I don't know if I'm going to make it back home. That's what he's saying. I die daily. Before I leave my house, I have to accept that I'm a dead man walking. That's all he's saying. Now we take it and we spiritualize it. And we say, oh, I die daily to my sin. Folks, if you're dying daily to your sin, then let me ask you a question. So on Monday morning, I wake up and I die to my sin. On Tuesday morning, I wake up and I die to my sin. All that means is that somewhere between Monday morning and Tuesday morning, my sin was resurrected. Came alive again. You see that? I went back into my sin. I am in fact describing the man that Jesus described who had the demon that was cleansed and the demons came back in. Folks. You don't need to die daily. You need to die once, just as Jesus died once for your sins. But even to use it in that context is not the same context that Paul spoke it in. Exactly. Paul is talking about something completely different. Yeah. He's not talking about sin at all. He's just saying that he puts his life in peril, in danger, in danger of death every time he goes out to preach the gospel. And why is he doing this if... The and, dead rise. Now. Right. He's but, doing this because he has that faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. But John continues here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, where he says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. No, hold on, folks. The first part, he said, he does not commit sin. That is on the man, right? That is on you and me. But the second part, he says, he cannot sin. No, that's not on him. That's not on me. That's on God. You see that, folks? He cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, folks, we like to say that we are born again, don't we? Okay, when you were born again, you became a new man. But as I have been teaching you from day one, that the reason why you needed to be born again is because of the dominion, the kingdoms. And in order to get from under Satan's kingdom to under God's kingdom, you had to be born again. Because when you were born the first time, when you were born of the flesh, you were born into Adam's curse. You were born into Adam's sin. You get that, folks? In order for you to move from under Adam, you had to now be reborn, be born again of Jesus Christ under God's kingdom. So you were born in the sinful nature of Adam. And then when you surrender to Jesus Christ and are converted, you are now born into Christ. Exactly. So you were originally born of Adam. So let's reuse the word that John is using here. 
you're originally born of Adam, but when Christ came, you are now born of God. Now, what happened when you were born under Adam is that sin became natural to you. Sin was a part of your essence. Sin was your nature. Remember, we have talked to you about that there are only two natures in the world. There's a nature of the flesh and then there's the nature of the spirit. Okay? Your nature when you were born of Adam was of the flesh. Sin was natural. It's your default. It's your default. Right? You couldn't avoid it. It was you. You had to sin. Now, when you are born of God, you're now a new creature with a new heart. And what comes natural to you is righteousness and whenever sin approaches you the first thing you do is that you shirk from it because it is repulsive to you it's repugnant to you the first thing you do is that it assaults your sensitivities okay even the sins that you love especially the sins that you love that you used to love right those sins they are now an affront to you you are totally disgusted with them now, folks, here's the thing about it. The longer you look at sin, the more appealing sin gets. So our problem is that when sin approaches, we start arguing with it. And this is what I'm telling you, folks. As a child of God, you have no need to argue with sin. You have no need to have a discussion with the devil. The answer is no. That answer is given to you. If you decide... And catch us, folks, if you decide to argue with the devil, then you are already in disobedience to God. Because God told you to draw nigh to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. There's no discussion. You never, ever talk to the devil. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now. If the devil appeared before me right now, I will not say, I rebuke you, Satan. No, 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 no. I don't play that foolishness. I will turn to my God and I will utter one thing, help me. And he will appear to Satan and say, I rebuke you, Satan. But I'm not going to confront Satan. Remember, Satan is a very, very powerful being. And what he does is that he will trick you. He has levels of deception so that you will think that you are resisting him. And what you're doing is actually playing right into his hand. That is why Jesus warned us. That in the latter days, if you hear that Jesus is in the cave or is in the wilderness, don't go. Because he says the moment you put your foot on the devil's ground, you will be deceived. That's how powerful he is. He's not to be trifled with. You deceive the very elect. So folks, when you are born of God, you cannot sin. And so let's go to Jeremiah 20 verse 8 to 9. And we'll see exactly how powerful this is. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. Because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Amen. When he said he could not stay, what he meant is that he could not keep his mouth shut. He had to speak. Why? Because the seed remained in him. Here's what he's saying, folks. He's saying that I have been talking and I have been prophesying and I've been telling people the word of God. And every day they threw it back in my face. And the word of God was made a reproach unto me. That is what he says. And a derision. Daily, they would slap him back with these things. And he decided that he's not going to say anything else. Right? He got tired of it. He says, I'm not going to talk to anyone. I'm not going to say anything. And he says, but the word of God was in my heart like a fire shut up in my bone. And I couldn't keep my mouth shut, even though I know it's going to get me in trouble. He could not keep his mouth shut, folks. Get this. Because if he kept his mouth shut when God told him to speak, that's sin. He cannot sin because the word of God, the seed of God, remained it in him. You see that, folks? That is why a true Christian cannot sin. He cannot sin 
because he loves God so much that he would rather die than to disappoint God. He understands that whenever he sins, what he's doing is that he's crucifying Jesus Christ a second time. He's dragging Jesus Christ through the mud, through the filth, through the garbage. And he can't do that. Why? Because I appreciate what he did for me in saving my soul. And so, folks, my question to you is, why are you and every pastor, elder, and member that you know still living in sin as naturally as breathing? I'll tell you the answer. Because they do not know the fear of God. You see, folks, we don't talk about the fear of God. And that is the key for you overcoming your sinful self. Here's what Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6 says. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Folks, if you don't fear God, you will never stop sinning. You have to understand how seriously God takes sin. God hates sin so much that he crucified his only son whom he loved. That's how much God hates sin. And we think that we can sin and just go to God and say, I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 10, 26 to 31. And we are going to understand why we cannot sin. Hebrews chapter 10, 26 to 31. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. Amen. And so you see, folks, when you understand what Paul is saying here, you will understand the direst consequence of sin. And let me just remind you what he said here. But I want you over the next week until our next study to read this passage every day, once a day. Hebrews chapter 10, 26, 31. Here's what he said. Under the laws of Moses in the Torah, there were certain sins that if you committed on the two or three witnesses, you were put to death. Now, folks, that's some serious consequence, isn't it? But then he goes on and he says in verse 29, of how much sorer, how much stricter, how much harsher punishment do you think shall he be thought worthy who has trodden on the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. That is when you have tasted of the goodness of God, as the Bible says, and you return to your wallowing in the slop. You return to your sins. He said, when this happened, God is most upset with you because you have basically spat in the face of Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross for your sin. That's what you're doing when you sin and call yourself a Christian. And Paul says, I ain't playing that. And I say, I concur. But John goes on in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, and he says, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And as I explained earlier, the reason why we can sin is because we are born of Adam. Okay? It's the family trait. You're under Adam, you sin. You're under Jesus Christ, you're under God, you do righteousness. It's as simple as that. It's black and white. I know we like to live in the gray area, but folks, I got to tell you something. It's a secret that the devil doesn't want you to know. There are no gray areas. 
if you're in the gray area, you're in darkness. There are no gray area. It's either black or white, light or darkness. And so let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So there you have it, folks. The reason why you cannot sin is because God abideth in you. God lives in you through the Holy Spirit. And as Paul says here in verse 21, he says, For he has made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Folks, are you the righteousness of God? Can we, as a demonstration to the devil, point at you and say, there goes the righteousness of God. That's probably part of the problem in our mindset is that people tend to think of righteousness as something that you put on, like clothes. So you can take it off and then you can put right, it on. Right. But here you see that it's not an item that you wear, but it's actually who you are. Exactly, exactly. It's your nature. And so, folks, we have one more verse to go. First John chapter 3, verse 10, and it says, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So folks, there we have it again, another black and white, another night and day description. In this the children of God are shown, manifested, exposed, and the children of the devil. And here is the distinction. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. So who is of God? Those who do righteousness. Those who do righteousness. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So if you don't love your brother, and who's your brother? Anybody you meet. Anybody you meet. Anybody you come across. And neither he that loveth not his brother. So who is of God? He that loveth his brother. He that loveth the stranger. He that loveth his enemies. He that loveth those who do not deserve love. And so folks, we're going to stop right here this week. And I guess we'll pick it up with this first because we need to go deeper into he that loveth his brother. Because this is one of the litmus tests of whether you and I are Christians. If I love my brother, it's a good indication that I'm of God. If I don't love my brother... It's an indication that I'm a fraud. But for you, remember, this week you're going to go and you're going to read Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 to 31. And for those of you who are hungry for the word, just read the entire chapter, Hebrews chapter 10. And you're going to do that once a day until we meet again and go on with our study. And I hope this will produce, and I know this will produce fruit in your life to the glory of God. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Until we meet again, walk with the King and be a blessing. Goodbye. <laughs>